Our next speaker has a different perspective on the growth of our industry. Over his 30 plus years with Westinghouse, he has experience with all aspects of nuclear energy. Rick Perez, President and Chief Operating Officer of Westinghouse Electric Company, led the company's four global product lines, nuclear automation, nuclear fuel, nuclear power plants, and nuclear services. He also was responsible for the company's licensing of the AP1000 reactor design, which received its design certification from the NRC late last year. He led a major global growth initiative for Westinghouse and oversaw the launch of the company's first new plant projects in China. Please welcome Rick Perez, a great partner and friend. Well, thank you. A little shorter here than Steve. Um, you heard some of the perspective from Steve uh, as a owner, as a uh, operator. Um, I'm going to give you a little different view. I'm going to give you a view from a perspective of a designer, as a constructor, uh, and then probably try to give you a little twist in the, in the uh, perspective of um, how does it look from a global perspective. Because you're going to hear from today's presentation, I think from my focus, on why I'm going to make the hypothesis to you that this is really a different world. This is not the 1970s and 1980s, not by a long shot. And that's not just about Part 52, though we'll talk about that. It's a lot about we're building in a new era. And our recognition that we're really building in a new era is something that we got to grasp, we can't be scared of, and we really have to master. So let's get into it. In the background, you're going to see a time-lapse pictures of one of the, the first or one of the 65 plants that's being built across the world today. In this case, it's a scene of the first AP-1000 being built in China at the Sandman Station. For Westinghouse and for many of you in this room, it's really a lot more than just an industrial construction site. It's a symbol. It's a symbol of a new era for nuclear generation, a new era of higher safety, and an era where we must recognize that we're connected globally and our ability to master that connectivity is essential. Sam Men 1 is the forerunner for Vogel and Summer. Sam Men 1 reminds us that our challenges are similar really across the world. You know, as a planet, we face the same kind of issues. Um, they're not they're unique challenges to the area we live in. Uh, we have to deal with you know, building new, built, new construction and nuclear in an era where there's an unbelievable demand from the uh, evolving economies. There's an increased environmental awareness. And the promise and the challenges of renewables and low price of natural gas creates a new framework for us to be able to be competitive and achieve our commitments. At the same time, the demands of the aging baseload are unbelievable across the world. The big difference in the 70s and the 80s was we didn't have 104 nuclear plants operating in the United States. Today, we're building the four units here in the United States, the four in China, in a framework we have to support 400 operating reactors at the same time. And even in that picture, if you think about the challenges on aging baseload in the United States, many of those people, maybe that picture in that corner may be a little distracting. That's not North Anna. Those, four, those two units that are in the foreground are the two units at Fessenheim, which will reach their 40-year anniversary as the first nuclear units in, in France and as you probably know, are, have come under a lot of attack, and the recent election of the elected president in France, Francois Hollande, has made a commitment to shut those down. Now, whether that goes through or not is not the issue. The issue is we're working within the framework that we must challenge, that we're, that we're going to be challenged with some new and some, some um, hurdles for new construction that have to be dealt with and have to be mastered. But one thing we can't forget about is whatever we do at the heart of how we challenge this thing, at the heart of who we are, that concept of nuclear excellence and nuclear, and nuclear operations got to be foremost. I would argue to you that a lot more came on shore on March 11th than a tsunami. 
What came on shore and what came down was the era where we could be insulated as an industry. We could just be Americans. We could just be Japanese. We could just be Europeans. That's gone. Today, if we're going to be successful, we're going to be a leadership, and nuclear is going to make an impact. Our ability to understand this global connection and make that difference is essential for us. Now, at the same time, there's some, some things that have gone very well. I think the, the vision that a lot of the leadership had in the United States, in Europe, for third generation reactors that really looked at changing the game relative to safety. That wisdom of our leadership in, that, in this era has really come to roost. The, uh, uh, the generation three plants, whether the AP1000 through passive safety, really were at the essence a policy decision made by our industry and our governments, mostly in the United States, North America, and in Europe, to really increase the level of safety and, very importantly, increase the level of engagement by the public, which was significant change from the 70s and 80s. How do we explain to our, to our stakeholders that these plants actually are safe, competitive, and can operate for 60 years was a, was a major issue. And I would argue that the level of engagement in Part 52 in the United States, 10 CFR 52, was a watershed for us. If you look at the, just the AP1000 license amendment, I'm not even talking about the original design certification. The license amendment, uh, which roughly took us about 24 months, incorporated over 60 public hearings. So in 24 months, 60 public hearings just on the design certification amendment. And when you add on the first public man mandatory hearings for the COLs at, um, at Vogel and Summer, the uh, independent public hearings they achieved, I would, I would easily guess we exceeded over 100 public meetings in the achievement of design certification and the, uh, the construction, the COL licenses for the, uh, for the two units. And it's that level of public transparency that Part 52 envisioned. That level of the fact that public engagement really referenced the ability to give public confidence, investor confidence, and confidence in the new generation of new reactors. That's really a significant change from what we've, what we've dealt with in the past. That leadership of our transparency of our process is something we've got to capture and be able to replicate in other parts of the world. So when we look at leadership, I would argue again that leadership is not anymore an insular or an American game. It's not a European game. It's not a Japanese game. It is a global game. The participant type management that we saw in Part 52 license, you can see it expanding in the relationship that the NRC now has with other regulators in the MDEP process. Here in the United States and in Asia, we're building simultaneously in both, in both uh, continents and the demands on the supply chain, the demands on each other, is much different than it was in the past. We have to master that ability to expand our leadership, to expand our global effect and impact than we have in the past. It is not sad anymore, satisfactory, for you, for me, for any of us, to benchmark solely with our peers around the United States. We've got to be able to share best knowledges, gain uh, experience, and I would contend the companies that are going to be successful in the future are going to be the ones that really master that capability. I would argue that also the most important place probably today that we have to deal with and model that is in our relationship with the Chinese. I want to take this opportunity publicly to thank a lot of you in this room. Um, I think uh, Dick Meserve talked about it, but I want to reference it, reference it. This past year, over 200 Chinese engineers were deployed all across the United States from the, from the two utilities that are building the Sam Men and Hai Young units to job shadow uh, with uh, various, of your, various of your plants. Now, what that enabled, that hospitality enabled, was the ability for many of you to visit Sam Men and Hai Young and for so, a lot of our clients here to be able to come and witness some critical construction evolutions at Sam Men and Hai Young face to face, eye to eye, understanding the challenges so we can capture and um, and really you know, improve from them in the future. It's just not sad anymore to have um, or to think that going an international trip is a nice to do. It's mandatory. If we're going to have nuclear, especially in the United States, that symbolizes that leadership for safety and, in the, and for success in the future. 
So I'm going to show you a little bit, as a reactor supplier, what we've taken out of the Chinese activity. What you see in the foreground is a series of shots of, of the reactor components that now have been completed for the AP-1000 in China. In, the, in, uh, in those pictures, you will see that we've finished all now, all the primary components for the, for the AP-1000 have built, been built through one time completed. We've also now submitted the plant reference simulator for Sandman 1. We're in the process of also then finishing the, uh, the testing in our cranberry facilities of the reactor protection system and distributed control system. And finally, as most of you probably noted, the first of a kind reactor coolant pump, can motor pump, very similar to naval propulsion type applications, was successfully tested at our partner facility in, um, in western Pennsylvania with Curtis Wright. The key issue is this. The confidence, the surety, the, the kind of, of, um, of mission that we're, uh, we have made for the United States for our infrastructure to be successful is based on their ability to deploy this reactor in China. The world's turned around. It's not the 1970s. It's a time where a developed nation can actually help us in deploying and regenerating our nuclear industry. So how do we take some of those lessons from China and apply it here in the United States? Um, I won't go through, a uh, through, through all of them. I will give you one or two. The one thing I will say to you, we've captured now over 10,000 different lessons learned coming out of Sandman and Haiyang, and uh, we've, we are actively uh, uh, app applying them at Vogel and Summer. As one example, the bottom head that uh, Steve showed you uh, that was being fabricated at Summer, uh, that was recently completed at the Vogel station. It was done for half, half the man months, the man hours that we did at Sandman 1. And it was all about the process, it was all about the, how we delivered it, how we assembled it to get efficiency. Now let's also be frank. We let, we're learning first time lessons in, um, at Vogel. Clearly, one of the things that is, is preeminent in Part 52 is that the adherence, strict adherence, to the design certification document, almost exactly like an operating plan FSAR, is mandatory. We struggle with that, some of the initial activities. As some of my uh, uh, colleagues indicate, um, and I, th I thought they were kind of joking when they first got into this, but it's, it's real. This is like a four-year outage. Building a plan is an outage every day. The conduct of operations of a constructor, of your workforce, of your uh, supervisors is not the conduct of operation that you had in the 70s and the 80s, and I would argue not even that in some of your other uh, power plants across the United States. It is really about the conduct of operations that feels and tastes and looks and responds to like you have in an operating station. So that ability to master that conduct of operations of our construction workforce is something that Clarence and I spend a lot of time on. And that we are going to get right, because that's the only way that we're going to be successful in building these plants for the first time in the United States in 30 years. But I don't want to stop just talking about the present. Let me finish up a little bit about talking about the future, because I think it's, if you think about the impact of nuclear for the future, it's important that we keep innovating. We don't just look, rest on the laurels that we achieved our first COL, but that we look at how do we make nuclear really impact and how do we decarbonize uh, our energy stream in the United States and across the world. And one of the key steps, I think, uh, that uh, Scott Maglia talked about was how do we capture what we learned on nuclear power 20, 2010, which I would argue I personally am very proud of, and I think this industry should be very proud of, that it met the achievement of that public-private partnership concept. It's one of the few places when you look at the U.S. government's ability to affect how industry and, and our society can be positively impacted for the future, it's a great example. So how did we actually take that and look at the ability to use that and leverage it uh, in the future. And one of the key uh, learnings from that, and I think is, a, is, been, uh, is you know, the basis for its modeling, was announced by the uh, Secretary of Energy uh, recently on his announcement on, ju on January 20th for the co-funding of the development of the new generation of uh, nuclear reactors to respond really to the need of the U.S. to replace an aging fleet of, of fossil units and to expand an industry that's going to be required to respond to an intermittency associated with large amounts of renewables and um, uh, in the, across the country. So the concept of the small modular reactor 
and you know, really much bases its, uh, its activity through the DOE funding on nuclear power 20, which is actually what we, 2010, which we really believe was a great model going forward. So leveraging those lessons learned uh, the AP, from the AP1000 and the design certification process on, under Part 52, this past Friday, Westinghouse and its partners submitted our response to that DOE program. So the promise of these new, re excuse me, those new reactors is pretty simple, and that is they're supposed to be factory built, and they're supposed to have low overnight costs. Uh, so the basic concept of the Westinghouse small modular reactor is to deliver 225 megawatts electric and load follow very similar to a gas turbine. Be able to, to maneuver the plant at about 5% per minute between 15 and 100% power. And together with our partner Admarin, we hope to launch a new era for nuclear generation in Missouri, new nuclear generation in Missouri. But I also want to emphasize something. It's not just about Missouri. What we look at the, at the SMR as a potential is the excitement and the promise it brings to bring new entrants into nuclear. The, um, the SMART uh, or the Next Start Alliance, if you look at the participants in that area, there are a lot more smaller utilities and co-op uh, co ops in the, in the Midwest that are going to be essential for our country's future to be able to decarbonize our, our energy stream. So the expansiveness, the, the ability to reach out into different parts of uh, the nuclear world that haven't been touched is a key promise of this technology. And we're very excited to go forward. So let me close with this. As an individual, I'm sure you've been touched over the last 10 years by the fact that the access to different parts of the world, your travel, your ability to connect, communicate, and the, the, the social media world has just expanded, exploded our ability to interconnect with, uh, with other people. As, as Clarence indicated, uh, this, is, this marks my actually 32nd year in this industry. I've been very blessed uh, to spend all my career in this industry. But I would argue with you that that same change that you feel personally, you better start feeling that pro uh, professionally. Because I believe that our leadership as an industry, America, Europe, Asia, is now ch the change of the game in this world now requires us to be able to make an impact and to connect and to really be an effective leader requires that kind of multiculturalism. Gone are the days when you can just simply call 001 and reach your supplier. You're going to have to dial a different country code. You're going to have to deal with a, a, a colleague or a, a sister plant that's in a different country. And our ability to master that, my ability to master that, my ability to communicate, your ability to, to make a, to share the same nuclear ethic that we all need is going to be a requirement for you, for me, for those who follow us. Thanks.